Dr. Sanjeev Arora is director and founder of Project ECHO, Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes, and is a distinguished professor of medicine in the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of New Mexico Health Sciences Center. The ECHO model was developed as an innovative paradigm to expand access to specialty medical care for vulnerable populations and underserved areas. Using video conferencing technology integrated with clinical management tools, ECHO builds capacity among community-based clinicians <clears throat> via case-based learning and co-management of patients. Please welcome Dr. Aurora. Good morning. I have no disclosures. At ECHO, our mission is to democratize medical knowledge and get best practice care to underserved people all over the world. Our goal is to touch the lives of one billion people by 2025. We estimate that in the world today, more than six billion people don't have access to the right care at the right place at the right time because the right knowledge doesn't exist at the right place at the right time. This is the problem we are trying to solve. Many of these six billion are children. The strategy we have is to move knowledge instead of moving patients. We started Project ECHO to solve one global health problem called hepatitis C. It affects 170 million people worldwide. We expect 30, 40 million people will die from this disease, from liver cancers and end-stage liver disease. If current rates of treatment continue, less than 3% of the world's population has been treated. In New Mexico, where I live, in 2004, there were 28,000 patients who had been diagnosed to have hepatitis C. Less than 5% had been treated. There were 2,300 prisoners who had also been diagnosed. This disease was and is curable. It was curable 70% of the time, but people who were poor were not getting treatment. What was the problem? The first was treatment involved weekly injections of interferon, a chemotherapy-like regimen, which was causing anemia, neutropenia, depression. But the bigger problem was not a single primary care doctor in New Mexico was treating hepatitis C. They were trying to come to my clinic to see me. They were driving hundreds of miles each way, 12 to 18 times. And if you were poor, you couldn't do it. As I mentioned, there was an eight-month wait to see me. So we developed ECHO to develop the capacity to safely and effectively treat hepatitis C everywhere. And we knew if we did that, we'd have a model to treat complex diseases in rural locations and in developing countries. There are four key principles on which Project ECHO is based. First, we use technology to leverage the expertise of a multidisciplinary team, in this case a psychiatrist, a pharmacist, and a liver specialist. The second key principle is to share best practices. Best practices is a concept based on the work of Edward Deming, who essentially defined the idea that if you want to improve quality, you want to standardize across a best practice, reduce variation in process. So what we did was we set up 21 centers of excellence for treating hepatitis C all over New Mexico. 16 of them were in federally qualified health centers and five in prisons in New Mexico. Each of these centers was run by a primary care doctor, a nurse practitioner, or a physician assistant. Then came the next principle. The question was, how are we going to take a primary care doctor or a nurse practitioner and make them as expert as a multidisciplinary team at the University of New Mexico? We said we would use case-based learning. We would train them exactly the same way how I became a super specialist. I would see a patient, present that patient to my professor, see another patient, present it again to the professor. This idea of iterative guided practice converted me from novice to an expert. And we said we would use exactly the same to train these primary care clinicians in rural areas, and we would use a web-based database to monitor outcomes. We train these physicians mid-levels in hepatitis C, train them to use our web-based software to track outcomes, and then we conduct these tele-echo clinics called knowledge networks. This is what a knowledge network looks like. In the big box, 
is the University of New Mexico, a liver specialist, pharmacist, and a psychiatrist. On the top right is Deb Newman from Espanola. She's presenting a patient of hepatitis C to us. She gives me 20 pieces of information in about five minutes and always in the same sequence. We help her manage the patient, then we go to the bottom left, that is Las Cruces, the Department of Health, and the bottom right, Las Vegas, uh, New Mexico. Over the course of two hours, we co-manage about 12 patients of hepatitis C, and we give them a brief 15-minute didactic presentation on some aspect of hepatitis C that we want to train them on. We call this a knowledge network. No patient ever comes onto this network. The way they become experts is called a learning loop. So they learn from our lectures, they learn from our advice, they learn from each other because they bring one patient to the network, but they learn on 12 every week. They learn on 500 patients every year that they attend this on a weekly basis. But mostly they learn by doing. How many of you have children that you've taught how to drive a car? Can you raise your hand if you have a many, many? If I told you that you have to train your daughter to drive a car by giving her lectures on how to drive a car, by giving them a book, giving them a written test, how many of you would feel comfortable giving them the keys to the car? That's exactly, there's only one child in the front who raised her hand. <laughs> yes, some people are special. <laughs> but for most of us, we need guided practice. We need guided practice to go from novice to expert. So we collect data. We give no-cost CME credits and nursing credits and, and give clinicians professional interaction with colleagues to similar, with similar interest, bring a mix of work and learning, and give them access to multiple specialists. The technology we use is very simple. We use in-cloud video conferencing solutions. The only thing a primary care pediatrician would need to do echo is have an iPad or even a smartphone or a webcam with internet access. We have recording systems so they can watch these lectures on YouTube later. And we have our software to run Echo. We've done 550 such clinics. More than 5,500 patients have entered the disease management program. We provide 63,000 hours of CME credit for hepatitis C and 12 other disease areas now. The first thing we wanted to study was self-efficacy. We knew that a primary care clinician would not give chemotherapy in a rural area if they didn't feel confident they could do a good job. After all, we still have attorneys there. <laughs> Here, the scale was one, I have no skills, seven, I'm an expert who can teach others. We asked them, what's your ability to identify candidates for treatment? 2.8 out of seven goes to 5.6 in 12 months. Question three, ability to treat hepatitis C and manage side effects, two to 5.2. Can you serve as a local consultant within your clinic and in your area for hepatitis C, 2.4 to 5.6? These are big, heavy effect sizes. Why is this question important? There are more than 3,000 clinicians in New Mexico. We only set up 21 centers of excellence. So what? If they only saw their own patients, nothing major would happen. What happens as soon as we set up a center of excellence in a rural area, these clinicians start accepting referrals and everybody in the community starts going there to be seen. The wait in my clinic at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque fell from eight months to two weeks. Overall competence, 2.8 to 5.5. We wanted to know, is this beneficial to primary care clinicians? Enhanced knowledge about hepatitis C, 97%. Being well informed, 94%. Achieving competence, 98% felt this was beneficial to them, not just their patients. It wasn't just a matter of improving access to care. It was professional development for these primary care clinicians. We wanted to know, we know that in New Mexico and in other rural parts of the United States, there is heavy physician turnover. We wanted to know, does Project ECHO diminish their professional isolation? We did this study in 2005. This and lots of other results are published in Health Affairs in 2011. Project ECHO has diminished my professional isolation, 4.3 out of 5. Enhanced my professional satisfaction, 4.8. Is a benefit to my clinic, 4.9. Expands access to hepatitis C treatment, 4.9. The next question is the critical question. Access in general to specialty expertise and consultation is a major area for need. For you and your clinic, 4.9 out of 5. This is the fundamental problem for children all over the world, basically. 
The problem is that in the United States, where we have twice the number of specialists than most countries in Western Europe, and 50 times the number of specialists in Africa and other countries, rural doctors are saying they don't have access to specialized expertise. That's why we think six billion people don't have access to specialized expertise all over the world. That's the problem we need to solve. We need to get the right knowledge at the right place at the right time so they can get the care they need. Finally, of course, it's not good enough for a primary care clinician to think that they have really amazing knowledge, they are confident, they are enjoying themselves. The issue is can they actually do as good a job as a multidisciplinary team at a university? We studied that and published this in the, in the New England Journal of Medicine in June of 2011. This is a prospective study in which the objectives were to train primary care clinicians to show that such care is as safe and effective as a university clinic and that we can improve care for minorities. We took 21 intervention sites, 16 community-based clinics, five prisons. The control was the University of New Mexico Liver Clinic where I practice. Principal endpoint was a sustained viral response. What does this mean? This means we treat for 12 months with injections and pills, and then we measure the virus six months after we stop treatment. This is the definition of a cure. A cure for hepatitis C is permanent. 15 years later, they're still cured. Even if they have cirrhosis, the point that we cure them, there is a 70% reduction in likelihood of dying from liver failure and a 93% reduction, sorry, 70% reduction in likelihood of dying from liver cancer and 93% reduction in likelihood of dying from liver failure over 10 years. These are the results in the New England Journal. Cure rate for genotype one was 50, 46, 70, 71 for different genotypes. Minorities were 68% in echo. Statistically different. Our conclusions were rural primary care clinicians deliver hepatitis C care under the aegis of echo that is as safe and effective as a university and that we can improve care for New Mexico minorities. The most important finding that we discussed in the discussion section of our paper was these cure rates were significantly higher than when solo specialists in the United States were treating hepatitis C. The VA reported cumulative data on thousands of patients in VA hospitals showing that the cure rate for genotype 1 was 20% versus our 50%. So we thought we should look at civilian sector, non-VA sites. The VIN-R trial, again thousands of patients treated by private practice gastroenterologists in the United States, cure rate for genotype 1 was 34%. We think that the treatment by primary care clinicians in rural areas can be better. And the reason is treating a patient close to their home in a culturally appropriate setting when they don't have to travel hundreds of miles, when, they have a, when we can have a multidisciplinary team that includes behavioral health, there is a tremendous shortage of behavioral health expertise. And when you try and bring best practice care for chronic disease without behavioral health expertise, it doesn't work quite as well. Patients don't take toxic medicines when they're depressed. They don't want to live. They don't want to take toxic medicines. Adherence suffers, and so does effectiveness. After hepatitis C was successful, we described six criteria. We said if the disease is common, if management is complex, if new treatments are coming, high societal impact, serious outcomes of untreated disease, and if you have effective treatment, you can use this model. Here I'm showing you the Pareto's principle, the 80-20 rule. We don't need to do echo for 200 pediatric diseases. If we do it for the top 15 or 20 diseases in adults like chronic pain, rheumatology, substance use, mental health disorders. If we bring the same level of care at a community health center in a private practice as we do at a university, you will have massive impact. This is the second most important slide here. This is called force multiplication. This is a US Department of Defense term. We have redefined it in healthcare as a logarithmic improvement in capacity to deliver best practice care. We need 10 times, 100 times the capacity. I mentioned there are 6 billion people who can't get good care in the world. If you suddenly double the number of specialists in the world, nothing would happen. Nothing would happen. So now we would have 5.8 billion people who don't get good care. We need 10 times. How do we get that? If you have a nurse or a primary care doctor provi providing the same level of care as a super specialist, then you get force multiplication. These are all the different diseases we do with echo in New Mexico, hepatitis C, diabetes, endocrinology, geriatrics, palliative care, complex care, rheumatology, chronic pain, addictions, mental health disorders, HIV, etc. 
What's the principal problem? The principal problem is the medical knowledge is increasing exponentially. The ability of a human being to learn all that stuff is going up only in an evolutionary pace. Some would say that is going down as we age. There's an increasing gap between what a doctor needs to know and what he can possibly learn. What's our solution? Give every primary care clinician a mentor at a public university. Have them develop on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, every two weeks, a special area of interest on which they are mentored, for which they serve their communities. It's not enough to treat just trained doctors. Chronic disease management is a team sport. In ECHO, we train community health workers, medical assistants, nurses to become experts, specialists in special areas. We've trained 150 diabetes community health worker specialists, 150 <clears throat> mental health disorder specialists, substance use specialists. What's the benefit to the world of pediatrics if we adopt ECHO widely, improve quality safety, rapid learning, best practice dissemination, reducing variation in care, improving access for rural underserved patients, workforce training, force multiplier effects, supporting the medical home model, improving professional satisfaction, cost-effective care by avoiding excessive testing and travel. Medicaid pays $400 for transportation of a person who's living in Silver City, New Mexico, to come and see me for one visit, preventing cost of untreated disease and integrating public health. What's the frame shift that we have to make? The frame shift is the current model of specialty care in the world is highly defective. It is based on knowledge monopolies. What's a knowledge monopoly? I'm a super specialist in hepatitis C. If you want to come and see me, I'll give you five, seven minutes of my time and I'll charge you hundreds of dollars. And guess what? There'll be a long line to see me all day long. That is terrible. It leads to tens of millions of excess deaths. A better model is to democratize medical knowledge. This is Albuquerque. This is our hepatitis C program in New Mexico. This is the 400 points of contact we have in New Mexico with the ECHO project. We have 20 separate programs now. The vision is, in one rural area and small town, we have at least one expert in hepatitis C, one in HIV, one in rheumatology, one in endocrinology, to help the patients where they live. These are the 47 universities in the United States that re have replicated ECHO, such as University of Washington, Harvard Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, University of Chicago, MD Anderson, Texas, Utah, Nevada, and many others. What are we doing in the world of pediatrics? We're doing India Autism Echo Project. We're doing asthma. University of Chicago is doing many. ADHD, obesity, children. University of Colorado, child, youth, and epilepsy. Georgia, growth and endocrinology, Kansas. Missouri Telehealth Network, Autism. Now, Mass General and this group um, have got uh, 12 centers in the United States starting Autism Echoes. This is the VA program, 11 university hubs connected to 600 clinics for 26 different disease areas. We have, we have Echo in 11 countries now for 46 different disease areas, countries like Uruguay, Argentina, Brazil, Northern Ireland, Irish Republic, India, Vietnam, Canada, and others. This is the team. We have a global collaboration with your organization, the American Academy of Pediatrics, to take ECHO worldwide, to improve the care of health worldwide. And this is the team, led by Dr. Ramesh Sachdev, uh, to um, bring ECHO to all of you. What makes ECHO work is team-based care. Task shifting is the idea of making every human being work at the highest level of their potential through guided practice, mentor mentee relationships. We want to produce a community of practice, a social network, along with joy of work to de by demonopolizing knowledge and creating a movement. It's not about building an organization, but we want to create a movement to change the world, to change the world for the better, to bring better health care to all children all over the world. How can you participate? You can participate in an ECHO project with a university near you. Send me an email and I will uh, connect you.